saying um, you are mentioned, managing director and There are still people signing in, so we'll be starting shortly. Okay. It is now the top of the hour, so let us get started. And good day, everybody, and welcome to today's Folio Forum, sponsored by the Open Library Environment and the EBSCO and Index Data. Um, I'm Sharon Wiles Young, Director of Library Access Services at Lehigh University here in snowy Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And I am also currently serving as the chair of the Folio Pro Product Council. Um, today, I will serve as your host. The forum today, the topic will be on a product owner update of the development and a roadmap update. Uh, first, we will begin with the product owners uh, presenting the development and um, end with the roadmap update. First, a couple of reminders. This session will be recorded, like all of our Folio forum, session, uh, forum sessions, and they'll be available on the openlibraryenvironment.org website. We have muted all participants, so we have a good sound quality today. And we encourage your participation and to ask your questions in the question Q&A box um, throughout the, the presentation. And we will try to answer some questions during the presentation, but um, uh, most of the questions will end uh, with at the end there. So please ask your questions. And if you're a Twitter user, please uh, use hashtag folio forum and we will monitor those for questions as well. Okay, let's get started. I am happy to have uh, the product owners with us uh, today. Um, and let's see, I will um, advance my slides here. And uh, the product owner, um, as you can see from this slide, is a very crucial role in the project here at Folio. It's um, a crucial person in the Agile development scheme, and this person uh, goes between our special interest groups and our developers. So they are crucial at bringing together functionality with the developers. So we're breaking down the product owners that are with us today by their work with their SIG groups. And the first uh, group um, under resource management, I'll introduce them quickly, is Dennis, who will go over acquisitions, and Kalela from EBSCO, who will go over e holdings. And then we move into metadata management and cataloging, and uh, Charlotte will handle that for us from index data. And then we'll go into resource access, our circulation SIG, and Catalina will talk about the calendar. Holly will talk about checkouts, loans, fees, and fines, and Tanya will um, talk about requests. And when they uh, go from person to person, they'll reintroduce themselves so you know what institution they're from or uh, what partner. Um, so now I will turn it over to um, Dennis from Stacks. Thank you very much. First and foremost, appreciate you guys having us here. Uh, Stacks is very excited to present some of the work that we've been doing 
on acquisitions. And my name, as was mentioned there, is Dennis Bridges. Hello, I'm the Chief Product Officer at Stacks Inc. And I'm also the acting uh, product owner for <clears throat> acquisitions for Folio at the moment. Um, my next slide here will show you just a few friendly faces from our team. So it's obviously, it's not just me. There's a large group of us. Our company is made up of engineers and developers and analysts and designers and so on. Um, and some of the more common names that you're going to see if you're interacting on Slack or, or in the wiki and things like that would be myself, Dennis Bridges, the PO, Kevin Horick, who's working on UX uh, and design, Walida Goon, who's our backend and, and mobile sort of specialist, and then Arvin Andrian, who's doing a lot of the front end stuff. And we're going to be looking at the user interface, actual components of the user interface. So we're looking at a lot of his work today as well. Um, in the next slide, I'm just going to go through an overview of essentially the, the work that we are doing in acquisitions, what is work on pr probably a, a significant portion, if, if not almost all of what we would consider acquisitions, breaks down into six different modules at the moment. So these six different modules that we're working on in Folio are vendors, uh, receiving, orders, invoicing, finance, and credits, as you can see in front of you. And they're actually pages uh, on the wiki under the resource management group Actually, within the acquisitions small group, uh, there is a page dedicated to each one of these modules uh, where you can see our entity reference diagrams that show some of the information about what we have in the databases for each module and so on and so forth. So maybe we'll move forward. The question I think we're really trying to ask today, so that's a, a bit about what we're doing. Um, the question that we're, we wanna really answer today and look at is where are we at the moment? And we wanna expose you to some of the actual coded interfaces that we have. So we want to do a little playing with Folio uh, today as well. So where are we in terms of these different modules? First and foremost, vendors uh, is the farthest along of all the different modules that we're working on. Um, we are now starting initiating the testing process. We are waiting to get this module uh, into the larger testing instance of Folio so that we can have folks start playing with it out in the community. My next slide will look at orders and receiving. Where we're at with orders and receiving, essentially we are ready now. We've been working a lot with the special interest group uh, in resource management and our small group that looks more specifically at acquisitions on a regular basis. Um, we've been talking a lot about the workflow of orders and uh, walking through that process and we're, we're ready now to start building the user interface for orders, which incorporates receiving as well. So we haven't started our, our user interface for orders yet, but it is on the horizon. In the next slide, we'll talk about in this invoicing. Uh, and invoicing is something where we're a little farther back from orders, obviously it comes after orders in the general workflow. And uh, with respect to invoicing, we are still working with the SIG group on refining <clears throat> our prototype. So some of the details and what you see on, the, on your right-hand side of the screen there is actually a mock-up of these different modules as we've been going through. And I'm sure the slides will be shared out uh, potentially after this. But So this is a mock-up of our invoicing module. We're still working with the SIG on refining uh, this module before starting implementation of the user interface. If you're curious, we have actually built uh, a lot of the back end of this module already. So what we refer to as CRUD or create, read, update, and delete functionality for this module is already built uh, and it's up at GitHub uh, as well, waiting to be added to the larger testing instances of Folio. The next slide and the final slide where we look at screenshots, uh, we'll, we'll discuss here finances and credits, which is probably the largest uh, of the interfaces that we're developing and arguably one of the more important uh, pieces of the module as well. Finances is where we manage all of the values that we're holding. Um, it's how we know how much we have to spend, how much we have spent, and so on, and keep track of all of those different things. And we're actually going to look at this interface today a little bit after, so I won't say too much about it, other than the stage of the process that we're at right now uh, is really working through fiscal year rollover. So with the SIG groups, we're going to be talking uh, probably this Friday, if you're curious, 
about fiscal year rollover and uh, putting in forward some of our, our mock-ups and designs and ideas and, and walking through that process and how that's supposed to happen. We're also working on finishing the Stripes user interface for uh, finances as a part of that conversation. So that will help us finish this interface that we're going to look at in a second. So that brings us to me probably sharing my screen a little bit, getting my hands dirty. So. So I'm hoping that all of you are seeing um, a, a Google Chrome window in front of you that says folio in the top left-hand corner. And what we're looking at here is actually our vendors module. So this is both the back end and the front end of vendors actually in code and functioning. And uh, so you can see very common to some of the other interfaces you'll see in Folio. We have what we call the sort and filter component um, where we're, we're seeing some of the possible filters we can use. And just a caveat here, obviously these interfaces are uh, very rough at this point still. You'll notice that there's, there's still a ways to go for them to look more like the prototypes or the mockups that we've put together. Uh, because this stage of the process, we're really focused on getting the functional elements that we need uh, for the software to work so that we can obviously test uh, a lot of the business logic and other things like that. So the look and feel is still a, a ways behind uh, where we would like it to be, of course. But to show you, to give you an idea of where we're headed, let's take a look at what we're seeing in front of us here. So on the left-hand side are filters where, for example, we can filter by active vendors or inactive vendors. We can filter by uh, vendors that prefer a certain payment method, just as an example here. So we could filter by active and so on. We can also search through our list of vendors here for something like EBSCO that will bring up a record, a specific record. And once we've done that, we see the details of that vendor on the right hand side. By default, all of the, what we call accordions are collapsed. I'll move a few things around my screen here. So we can expand all of that information to see all the details that we've collected regarding this particular vendor, uh, or all the detail that we could be possibly collecting for this particular vendor, vendor record. We can also edit that record um, and change the information that we've got for this vendor. A lot of these fields will allow you for address, for example, to add multiple addresses, multiple contacts with respect to contact information, uh, and so on. So then from here, if we were making changes, for example, we would then be updating. And we can, of course, remove our filters. We can add new records to the system and so on. When we look at finances, we're going to see a similar format here. And in finances, if you've been a part of some of those conversations or you've explored the wiki a little bit, uh, you've noticed that the way that we're breaking down our finance module is by four very specific things. We have ledgers, we have funds within those ledgers, we have budgets associated with funds, and then of course we have a fiscal year. So you can start seeing in this interface things coming together in terms of the area where you will be able to edit, create, update, and delete all of those things. And as a part of their details, like for the ledger, for example, we'll eventually be able to associate funds with ledgers, uh, budgets with funds, and so on from here. So right now, with respect to finances, as you're seeing in front of you, for the most part, what we have is create, update, you know, read and delete uh, for ledger, fund, budget, and fiscal year, uh, both the, the backend requirements of that and now uh, the user interface that allows us to interact with that backend. So a lot of progress being made. We're very excited about uh, finances because it is the largest module that we're working with, both in terms of the, the backend and the business logic, as well as the front end and the user interface. So it's very exciting for us to be able to show it to you today because this is kind of the first time we've done 
uh, a public demo for the finance module as well. And I think we'll have some time for questions, so I'll probably leave it there and we can move on to uh, the next presenter. So thanks very much. Thank you, Dennis. Um, can you stop sharing so I can? Never. <laughs> stop sharing? What? <laughs> Okay. Okay. Let's see if I get back in. Okay. Now we turn it over to Kalela for the e holdings app. Over to you, Kalela. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, let me... And while you're getting set up, I just noticed there was a question. Um, how can we add contact type like consortium publisher, Dennis? Realizing I'm still on mute. So how could we add a contact to a vendor, for example? Yeah, like consortium or publisher or in your contacts there. So the way, the way we've broken down contacts for vendors is that we have addresses that relate to, and so I'm going to, I'm going to go to edit here. Our contact information is separated by contact information for the vendor itself, which we would see here. Oops. Uh, Wait, I think. Uh, I'm not sharing anymore. Am I? Uh, yeah. I am. Okay. Do you want me to get out? Let's see. There you go. You can share. Okay. <clears throat> so just quickly, uh, so we're back into the vendor record here and we're editing the vendor record and we see two accordions, one for contact information. I'm just going to close it quickly. So one for contact information, one for contact people. Uh, so if it were specific to a consortium, we can add details regarding the address, phone number, potentially email and URL that are associated with the actual vendor itself. But we could also add contact people. And those people may be associated with certain addresses. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, they may be associated with the vendor in different ways. And they may handle certain areas. So we have a category for contact people. We have a category for contact information as well. Does that answer your question? I think we're good. I don't see anything mm -hmm. else. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. My pleasure. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Are you all set? I believe I am. Uh, good day, everyone. My name is Kalila Gimbrell. I'm the product owner for the eHoldings app, and I'm based in Ipswich, Massachusetts. Um, and I work for EBSCO Information Services. And I'm happy to uh, be here to provide an update on eHoldings app development. Okay. Let me see if I can get this to advance. Okay. Oh, Kalila, we lost your audio. You're, you're on mute. Oh, okay. I'm am I back. Yeah. All right. Thanks. So uh, I'm just going to give an overview of the Holdings app, and then I'll demo what we've done so far. So the app is an integration of a knowledge base with Folio. Um, front side is the team developing the app. Um, this is a team that's based in Austin, Texas that has worked on several open source projects. Uh, the EBSCO knowledge base is uh, the first uh, knowledge base to be integrated uh, with the eHoldings app at this time. And for this initial release, uh, the we're focused on basic holdings management capabilities. So the ability to search providers, packages, titles, uh, the ability to access provider package and title package details, uh, the ability to select and unselect 
um, packages and titles from your hold to and from your holdings and the ability to manage if you need to uh, if you prefer at times to manage uh, certain values um, rather than the knowledge base managing um, certain values um, you have the ability to manage coverage date um, uh, the ability to determine when to um, um, to allow um, the automatic selection of titles from a, a package you've already selected, the ability to control uh, the patron UI uh, display of your packages and titles in those packages, uh, as well as customize embargo should you need to. And um, we haven't developed this aspect yet, but we will have it available for the initial release of the eHoldings app, the ability to create custom title and a custom package. And yes, now we're ready for the demo and I'm going to share my screen for that. Alrighty. All right. There we go. So this is the eHoldings app here. And um, as I mentioned before, you do have the ability to search by providers, by packages, and by titles. And so when you're on the titles uh, search, you have the ability to specify what you would like to search by, whether it's by the title, ISSN or ISBN, publisher, or subject. Um, you also have the ability to filter your result set by um, to view every single um, title, whether it's selected or not selected, uh, or as far as in your holdings, whether it's selected in your holdings, not selected, um, or if it's uh, something that was ordered uh, through EBSCO. You also have the ability to filter your result set by uh, publication types, and here's the, the publication types you have the ability to, to filter your result set by. With packages, and uh, I had already done a search before. You have the same capabilities that you saw with titles, the ability to filter your result set by the number, uh, by whether you've selected those packages and they're a part of your holdings. And I'll do a quick search so you can see that. Um, or you're able to um, filter the result set by content type. So the overall content type that's in that, of, of, as far as the titles that are in that package. And with provider, you do have the ability to sort your result set and that, that capability will be available on packages and titles too in an upcoming sprint. But for providers at uh, this time, you do have the ability to sort by the provider name or by relevance. So let's do a search for a provider. You can see I've already conducted a search before here and I've done a search for American Medical and you'll see uh, a list of providers uh, that return when I conduct that search. I select the first one here American Medical Association here and you'll see here it says um, American Medical Association it tells me how many packages that are that this provider uh, offers that I've selected and the total number of packages that this provider offers. And from here, you get a list of the packages here. And from here, you can see which ones are selected or a part of my holdings and which ones are not a part of my holdings. And you also have um, the count as, as to how many titles in that package I've selected and are a part of my holdings and the total number of titles that are a part of uh, this package here. And that's the counts that you see here with each one of these items too. So when I click on a package here, I'm able to see um, uh, the provider as well as the uh, content type. And again, the count that I mentioned before. Here I'm able to determine whether I, I've, if this title is a part of my holding, this package is a part of my holdings or not. I can, you know, from using this toggle, I can actually remove it from my holdings. I get a message that says, uh, are you sure you want to do that or not? In this case, I'm going to say, no, I, I don't want to remove it. And I also, also can control the visibility to the patron. So this is the control that allows me to determine if I want the package and the titles in this package to display on my um, A to Z list.
This is what visible to patrons means. And then allow knowledge base to add new titles. This controls whether or not I want the, when new titles are added to this particular package, if I want the knowledge base to automatically select these and add these to my holdings. And from here, if I need to set a package coverage date, um, I can click on set custom coverage and I can actually specify the coverage date I want uh, uh, set for the package. Uh, which would then set kind of the gauge, the uh, range for um, the, 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 the coverage dates that are applied to each title in the package. Also on the screen, I'm not only able to see um, basic information about the package, but I'm also able to, to and, and, and make some edits and selections for that package. I'm also able to see the list of titles that are in that package and see which ones are selected and are part of my holdings and are not. So if I take a look at um, archives of dermatology here, I'm able to access the titles in that pack, the, the titles uh, detailed record. And from here, I have um, metadata that I can uh, see about this particular title archives of, of dermatology. I'm able to uh, click to access the package detail record again, or the provider detail record. And I'm also able to click this link to actually go directly to that, uh, that particular title. I'm also able to see what the knowledge base stores as far as the managed coverage dates as well. And from here, I'm able to control at that title package level, whether this should be a part of my holdings or not, and whether or not this particular title package should be uh, displayed to my patrons um, through the A to Z list that I may have. And from here I can actually specify the coverage dates for that particular title package. I can actually set up, if I have coverage gaps, I can set up multiple coverages as well. And if this uh, particular title has an embargo that the knowledge base may not uh, be aware of. It's maybe an embargo that's specific to my purchase of a title and uh, title um, that's a part of this package, then I can actually set the embargo here. So I can actually put the, the number of days or weeks, months, years, all here. And then if I'd like to see uh, the other packages that contain this title, I'm able to do so by clicking this link that might be hard to see on your on my screen, which is view all packages that include this title. And from here, I'm able to see um, some basic metadata about this title and see what additional packages contain this title. So that's uh, a overview of all the work the team uh, has done with regard to the eHoldings app. Any questions? Sorry, Sharon, I can't hear you. Kalila, there are actually have, three. Yeah, we have a couple questions for you. And one of them, um, if you could clarify, if an eBook is in multiple packages, will we be able to sort the result list by package name? If, um, so in this particular example here, um, so let's say this was an ebook here, and this is the list of packages. Yeah, we, we will, uh, we are working on functionality that would allow you to sort or filter um, to, um, so that it displays in, in alpha order. Great. The next question is, from where is the information coming to populate the knowledge base? Is it EBSCO? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the last question, are you planning to create an icon to differentiate between subscribed and knowledge-based resource packages in this case at, at the initial page? So uh, at the result, uh, is the question more or less when you're on the search result list, the ability to de determine whether you have selected or not selected that title or that package? Yeah, we are working on um, uh, some uh, UI, um, a, 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 a more improved um, UI experience when it comes to determining whether or not you've selected this title or this package on the 
result list or on the detailed record where you might see the titles that are in your package. So it's, it's much easier to indicate, to see what, what you have as a part of your holdings or not. And the last question, uh, will there be the potential to link into license data? That's a great question. Uh, there's actually, uh, I think there's a, uh, another uh, subgroup uh, that's a part of the RMC called the ERM group, a subgroup, and they are beginning to um, uh, collect requirements and define requirements tied to licensing. And so uh, uh, I don't have much details on where that is, but I know they're beginning to collect those requirements. Yeah, that's a good question. Yes, it is. Thank you, Kalila. Um, Thank uh, um, I would just like to add one more piece here. In this case, we see EBSCO's knowledge base connected to Folio, um, but uh, we do expect over time, in fact, we know of other projects to interconnect others as well, um, but that will take a little bit of time. Yes, thank you for that clarification. Okay, so now um, we'll go to our next uh, There's There is actually one more question. Um, oh, there is? I'm sorry. Uh, it, it came through a different path, though. Is there, <laughs> is there a way to batch holdings? Um, to batch load holdings. My oh, apologies. yes. Yeah. Um, at this time, uh, the app doesn't have the capability to do this, but um, uh, with the, uh, since we are for the initial release using, or not initial release, but at this time, since this app is integrated with the EBSCO's Knowledge Base API, um, we could use the uh, EBSCO's native Knowledge Base interface to import or batch load uh, holdings. Uh, in general, across the project, um, there is a backlog of features that still need to be worked on that relate to batch loading of data throughout. Um, everything from data that relates to acquisitions, uh, to e-holdings, to catalog, and so on. Some of the areas, some of the basic tools are there, but they need additional work. In other cases, they have yet to be started. And... Uh... Can I ask you one more question? <laughs> uh, uh, will there be a mechanism to normalize resource types, such as EBSCO might call a particular title a journal, another knowledge base might call it a magazine? Um, so I, I think that um, um, with uh, we've tried to make the back end and front end of this e holdings app fairly flexible so um as harry said as if you know as more as we have folks who determine they want to you know, integrate their knowledge bases i think it's flexible enough to support the fact that uh, there may be different terminology used or, or supported to identify that yeah that's mm -hmm. great Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Good questions too. Uh, Layla, could you um, stop sharing? So then I'll try to get back. Thank you. Sorry for takes a little bit for the and then is it Charlotte that's up next uh, yes okay let me try to get this to advance here it's being difficult okay yeah. there we go okay thank you <clears throat> I am uh, Charlotte Witt, and I'm a librarian, um, and I have a master in information technology uh, from the uh, University of Copenhagen. 
Uh, I have worked uh, most of my work life uh, with metadata uh, and um, um, library um, uh, information technology. I have now been with the Folio project for uh, two years uh, and I'm working full time uh, on Folio. I live in Sweden uh, and so I, it's a uh, late afternoon here for me. Um, today I will uh, talk about the inventory app and the codec search. Um, um, index data has been involved in this project uh, from the very beginning. Uh, actually, we have been uh, uh, yeah, with the project since it was just a, uh, yeah, an idea and later it grew into be a vision and an opportunity and uh, a concept. And uh, now we see uh, more and more pieces coming together and we have um, several apps, uh, um, fully working apps. Uh, so it's, um, I think we have some really interesting months uh, ahead of us because so much is coming together, so much is being developed um, right now. Um, in the project, I, I started uh, doing requirement analysis and uh, gathered uh, functional requirements. Maybe some of you remember the functional matrix. Uh, today, I'm the product owner of the uh, inventory app and the codec search app. Um, <clears throat> I'd say that uh, um, my typical day varies between meetings with uh, the SMEs, uh, participating SIG meetings, uh, Slack chat and calls with developers uh, and uh, UX designers. And then I do some more uh, yeah, documentation-like uh, tasks, uh, write up to Jira stories, uh, follow up on yeah, all kinds of stuff. So um, it's very interesting to be product owner for the Folio project. But um, we will start to talk about the um, in inventory uh, app. Um, we have implemented the uh, metadata elements. Uh, we have, uh, I have put up a link to the Wikifolio. And um, the way we uh, have structured our bibliographic data is that we have instance records, we have holdings records, we have items records. Uh, the requirements uh, are defined together with the MMSIC. Uh, and uh, uh, the way we have been working is that we have settled different uh, smaller working groups. We have had a mark mapping um, working group. We have had a, a um, working group focused on holdings data. We have um, a, a cross-functional working group together with the resource access uh, SIG, where we are defining resource type, format, material type. And uh, one of the uh, upcoming uh, new uh, working group will uh, be um, um, discussing uh, the advanced search feature. Uh, so if you, like Dennis also said, uh, want to be involved, then um, there's plenty of opportunities. Uh, What I will demo today is the alpha release. Uh, it was released uh, January 2018, uh, yeah, a couple of months ago. Um, it uh, holds uh, 1.8 million records. Uh, these uh, records are coming from um, um, Harvard University Library. <clears throat> and uh, the inventory app is developed by the core team. Um, it's, uh, there's, it's a huge team. Um, uh, counting developers from Index Data, the OLE developers, um, and EBSCO. The lead developer is uh, Nils Eric Nelson from Index Data. <clears throat> um, you probably can recognize uh, that uh, Mac PC that's uh, borrowed from Dennis last night. It was very late. I had to do these uh, uh, slides for this uh, event. So it's uh, Dennis's uh, creative work I have borrowed with his approval. <clears throat> but here is a very small uh, screen of uh, what is uh, the inventory app looking like. <clears throat> uh, I would uh, 
do the demo now. So if I can share my screen. Thank you. So this is the alpha, the folio alpha version. And uh, we're so happy we are we just uh, actually for tonight's uh, this uh, event, we have finally got the icons also uh, implemented for the folio alpha version. But I will open up the inventory app. Yes. Um, again, um, they lay out uh, from uh, the other apps. It's this recognizable uh, um, paneled structure, and we have the search and filter in the left side, just exactly as uh, you saw in the um, in the orders app and in um, the e holdings app. Um, um, a little uh, show by Dennis and Kalila. Um, we have uh, right now a, a simple search box uh, where you could um, search, just type in a, a search. Uh, it has a type of head. You can see it's, um, uh, maybe this is very small, but you, actually you could see something's happening that this, the, uh, while I'm typing, then uh, the search is being uh, refined. Um, it's uh, possible, we have uh, implemented uh, filters, we have the resource type, we have uh, languages we can filter, and we have a location. Uh, uh, this is what we have implemented for uh, alpha. I can uh, click on a record, and uh, here we have um, here in the third pane, uh, when I click on a record in the result pane, uh, result list, uh, then I get my detailed record. Um, and with, uh, in, in light gray, we have all the, uh, that's the name of the uh, elements we have implemented um, right now. We are going to uh, add uh, more elements. Um, uh, but this is um, uh, ongoing work um, that we are refining um, all the data. Um, <clears throat> you, it's possible to create a new record totally from, from scratch. I will not start doing that. Um, it is uh, possible and I just would show you how fast uh, the system actually uh, works. I could try and um, two seconds. I will. I have a cookbook here of what I would, so I'm sure that I do it correct. Um, I would search for um, again. You notice the type ahead, um, and then I would uh, use my filters to uh, select a, a journal. Then I choose serials, and then I can drill into uh, um, a journal here. And if I uh, want to, uh, if I want to uh, do um, duplicate this record, I can just click on um, and create a new instance record. Uh, fill in uh, the relevant information. And uh, then um, this record would be um, uh, created and it would be, um, as, um, it would uh, be uh, given a, a unique folio ID for this new record. I will not start this process, but it's um, uh, also working quite well. Um, if I wanted to uh, do some changes, I could also uh, um, change uh, the title. If that was uh, something I needed to correct, I could uh, add um, classification, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And here it warns me 
uh, I have not uh, done the update, so uh, do I want to close without savings or do I want to keep editing? In this case, I just say close. Um, we have an, a note feature. Uh, unfortunately, we have a bug here, so, but I'll just skip this one. Um, but the idea is that here you could uh, assign a task to your colleague. Uh, so, please, uh, John Doe, um, correct this or that or what it must be. And then I could post it. And then uh, my colleague, John, would, uh, would get uh, this message. Um, yes, um, that was a quick overview of, uh, yeah, I also would show you here um, that we have the holdings um, data. Um, in this case, uh, I just have the holdings, added the holdings, and I could um, add more holdings, I could uh, add uh, item records, etc. Um, right now, we don't have that much uh, item data in uh, holdings and item data in uh, the alpha. Um, but um, yeah, um, we are working on uh, imp uh, importing uh, these data. Very, very quickly, I would sh right now, this is the look and feel for uh, the alpha version. Um, but we are working towards implementing um, uh, the design uh, Philip Jacobson has um, uh, come up with in dialogue with, uh, together with the uh, metadata management SIG. And in the um, um, refined UX, we will implement a hierarchical stru structure of the instance record, holdings data and item data. We will have a uh, possibility to search on specific uh, holdings data here uh, and uh, something similar we will do for the uh, item data. We will implement a, a level navigation um, also to um, support the hierarchical structure. But this is something uh, um, we will implement uh, these uh, coming months. Uh, and it will uh, be a part of uh, what we release uh, for um, the beta release in, uh, in uh, June, July. Um, and I, as I said, we will implement uh, more uh, metadata elements. Um, we have identified uh, in several of the um, MMSIC uh, working groups, uh, several uh, uh, elements we need to add into the system. Um, we call them, we have this working title for them as the missing elements, but um, uh, they are under their way. We'll also uh, uh, work on implementing a targeted search uh, more filters and uh, discussing uh, faceting. Yeah, that was uh, what I planned to tell you about the inventory app. Any questions? Yeah, we do have some questions. Okay, <laughs> Charlie. sounds good. Um, how does the searching inventory handle titles that start with stop words like the? Um, yeah. But we um, we will uh, have um, all these initial uh, words uh, the a etc. Uh, they it will vary from language to language. Um, uh, what initial words we need to ignore when we are doing title sort? We have this implemented. Um, so that was will be something uh, configurable. Um, and, and that is something we are working on. We don't have it right now, but um, this is, um, um, yeah, okay. uh, defined and uh, something we are uh, in process of uh, solving. Great. 
The next question is, any advanced search option where we can select more fields like author, et cetera, to get the relevant results? So the advanced search, yeah. Yeah, the advanced search uh, will uh, include uh, the possibility to uh, combine search. Um, what we will implement uh, for the basic search would be, um, uh, uh, yeah, I will show it uh, in, a, in a second when I show the codex search, but the possibility to define what element to search on. And it will be possible to search on all fields. Um, and, and the uh, advanced search, um, this is something uh, Philip, uh, he has had one, um, um, one uh, session talking about this with the MMSIC and we are uh, um, settling um, a new working group uh, who will work with Philip and, and probably his colleague uh, Kimi O. Yang also um, to how should we, um, um, yeah, how should we present this search page? How should we, uh, how should you, the user interface be for this? Um, it is Lynn uh, Wittenberger who is uh, coordinating uh, this uh, working group. So if you're interested in it, then uh, please uh, send an email to her and uh, participate in that work. Thank you. Um, the next question is, um, what about putting the easy proxy string um, with the URLs? Um, has that been discussed? Uh, no, not, not really. Um, I'd say we, uh, that question uh, we probably need to get back to. Um, um, so I can't answer that. We have the URL right now implemented. Um, mm -hmm. So, but uh, we, we still have some um, questions about, uh, um, yeah, how this is gonna uh, be, uh, how this is gonna work. Okay. Um, will you be able to hide notes from patrons, the notes? Oh yeah, those uh, notes, uh, as I showed you, uh, that is just, uh, that's a, sh a note uh, for this specific record and this is just staff notes. Or are you talking about these kind of notes? This is notes in the, we have different types of notes in uh, inventory. We have um, notes uh, attached to the, um, to, to the, uh, instance record, the bibliographic record, and we are also talking about having notes uh, to the item record and to the holdings uh, records. But it should be possible to suppress uh, data which we are not interested in uh, showing to the patrons. They just wrote in to clarify, yeah, notes to your colleagues about updating records. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, sure, of course. Yeah, that will be good. Okay, and one last question. Is the inventory module set up to allow to send a student employee into the stacks with a barcode scanner connected to Folio and gather stack location information into Folio? So, um, uh, it's not something or, the yes. inventory is set up to, but uh, I guess uh, probably uh, Holly will uh, talk more about this when she is uh, uh, talking about the check-in module. That's right. We'll we'll talk about that later in the the resource access. Yeah. Okay. I will stop sharing because now we need to go back to the other yeah. slides part of my demo. Thank you so much, Charlotte. You're welcome. Okay. Okay. Did you oh, want to yeah. go back on that yeah, I one? I, I have a little to start uh, out with. Um, the, um, we have built the uh, Codex uh, search app and that was uh, part of the uh, alpha release uh, released in uh, Madrid uh, a couple of months ago. 
Um, the initial scope for the Codex Search app was to uh, prove the concept of searching across apps. Um, the Codex Search uh, app searched both uh, printed material and um, electronic resources. And um, if you kind of see this uh, module, then uh, in the bottom we have uh, to the left, we have the local inventory. That was what I just um, showed you. And then in the middle, we have the EBSCO knowledge base. That would be the e-holdings app, uh, which Kalila showed. And then to the um, uh, right, you have kind of any data source. Uh, so that is uh, that we are ready uh, to um, implement uh, more knowledge bases or more local inventories uh, in the codex search. But right now we have just two. We have the inventory and we have the e-holdings. But we are able to, we, we have proved that it is possible to search across the knowledge base and the local inventory. And that was what kind of was, that was the goal and what we wanted to accomplish for this alpha release. Um, um, the codex search um, has, uh, is compared to the inventory, a more simplified and generalized uh, metadata model. Um, and, and that is uh, um, in order to be able to uh, implement all kinds of sources. Um, and the codex search doesn't know about any of these sources, but it's able to kind of be this uh, through the uh, codex multiplexer layer, able to handle any sources. Um, so, so kind of the codex search is uh, operating on a, a, a level where the um, um, metadata records, they are more um, similar with Dublin core records uh, and less uh, detailed uh, as you probably know uh, from the mark, date, mark records. So if you want to have the very detailed information, then it would be the inventory uh, app you uh, had to go to um, and, and uh, not the codex search. Now I'm ready to do the demo. And then I switch to the codex search. Here we go. Again, we have this very recognizable uh, layout, with the paint uh, uh, structure. Um, in this case, uh, we don't see any titles uh, when we start out uh, with the search. That was the case in the inventory uh, where you have this kind of examples of what is it you can find in this uh, uh, app. We have um, this, again, it's, it's, uh, it's this, the same comp components we are using. That's also uh, making this very efficient to build these apps. Um, but in the, um, here in the codex search, uh, different from the uh, inventory, you decide I want to search only in my local, in my inventory, or I want to search in my knowledge base. In this case, it then would be the e-holdings um, app. I choose to search across both of them, and um, then I can decide. I have these, um, um, elements I can do my targeted search on. I can decide to search, um, yeah, I can search on an ISBN. Let me see. Two sec, I had some an ISBN prepared, but I'm not sure I can remember. So no. Let me see if this gives a hit. Yeah, yeah, come. I, just panning a, a second here if I was able to remember. 
Um, here you see a, a search on a specific, on, on a given uh, ISBN number, and uh, I get uh, a link. And this is um, a title uh, in the eHoldings app. I can go back to my codec search. I can try and then I will clear the search and then I can uh, search for something where I know I will get a hit in both uh, sources. Again, see what's missing here. Oh, of course, I was wrong. I should change my uh, search. Uh, <clears throat> Here I search on a title and I search on Arctic and I'm searching across um, uh, both sources. And this is uh, 704 records found. Uh, and uh, these records are all uh, titles in the um, uh, local. Uh, and it, when there's a gray icon, then it's a, a title uh, in the um, knowledge base. I can decide to uh, search just on um, a journal. And then my search very immediately uh, is uh, narrowed down to um, just uh, eight records. And here you can see the, the icons for the e-holdings. It's not going to be a gray. We, we just haven't uh, implemented, uh, uh, we haven't uh, the small version of the e-holdings uh, uh, yet, but it will soon be implemented. Um, I can show you a record uh, in the uh, inventory. Um, again, yeah, this is um, yeah very uh, recognizable from. Uh, so I think it it will be very easy to uh, um, uh, to switch back and forth between these uh, apps uh, because um, you. And you get clear guidance uh, by the icons, and um, yeah, in this case, it's a resource type. What 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 it is uh, you have found, and uh, what is this record is. If I want to reset all, I just click on this one, and then I'm completely back to to scratch again. That was a speedy demo of the codec search. Any questions? I think we don't have any right now, so we're going to keep moving on here. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. All right. Thank you, Charlotte. All right. Okay. And now I'll turn it over to Kathleen uh, for resource access. Hello, I'm Kathleen Lobagnesuch from Kultur ATD, uh, Hungary, Szeged. Uh, I've been working here for seven years, most, mostly on uh, library management software. And we joined the Folio project last year and uh, we are currently working on the institutional calendar. And on the next slide, you can see a summary about the module, uh, current capabilities. So we now have the option to create a, an opening period with multiple opening hours each day and uh, we separated the settings page from the events view. So you can view the opening hours in the calendar view and you can also update or delete an opening period. And uh, the exceptions are yet to be implemented. 
And on the next slide, you can see uh, the creation of the new opening period. Uh, uh, the design is not, not final. We will talk uh, with Philip about it. But uh, now it's working and uh, the time so will be replaced uh, with, uh, with the time picker component as soon as it will be available. Uh, on the next slide, uh, you can see the details of each opening period. Uh, this is uh, available from the settings page in the calendar submenu. So here you can uh, view the opening periods start and end dates and the uh, opening hours for each day. On the next slide, you can see the edit page of the opening period, which is the same uh, than the creation, only you have the delete opening period option also. And on the next slide, you can view the event view of the calendar, which is uh, available from the calendar application, on, as you can see on the top. Uh, this is the month view uh, where you can see the opening hours of each day in the calendar and you can change the months back and forth as necessary. Um, that was all for me. The calendar is, uh, will be, uh, calendars will be connected to circulation desks, but uh, that's uh, still under development and consultation. Any questions? Don't see any questions right now, so we'll just keep going. So okay. we're, we end on time. That would be great. Thank you so much for showing us that. Okay, Holly, do you, are you going next? Yes. Uh, can everybody, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, my name is Holly Misselbauer and I work at Cornell University. I'm an IT project manager and I'm also uh, a librarian. And I am a product owner for Folio, working on uh, patron checkout, and, or working on checkout and working on fees and fines. Um, earlier, it was mentioned uh, that I would be talking about check-in, but I actually did not work on check-in and I'm not planning on talking about it. So I'm sorry about that. Um, so the checkout, this is the uh, page that you'll see uh, before you've started anything at checkout. So you're getting ready to do a checkout. On the next screen, uh, you'll see what will be displayed um, Oh, one too far. Sorry. Okay, so this, this is what will be displayed if you have a proxy relationship set up. So if Jane Doe, let's say, is a graduate student and she has a proxy relationship set up with two faculty members um, to do library transactions on their behalf. And so this is, uh, so when she comes into the library, she'll be asked, are you acting on behalf of yourself or are you acting on behalf of one of your sponsors? Um, one of her relationships is expired, uh, but she has indicated to us, I'm acting on behalf of Julio Smith. So then uh, after you select uh, continue, the, the next page that comes up will show you information about the patron who is, you know, the, the borrower is actually Julio Smith and you'll see information about Julio Smith, what uh, overdues he has, what items are available, uh, recalls, uh, general information. And then you also will see information about the proxy who is standing in front of you. Um, if your institution elects to have photos, a photo will show up, otherwise there won't be anything there. So there won't be a little image box there. So now you're ready to scan the first item. Um, so if you go to the next screen, you can see what it would look like. Uh, on the left now, you're seeing uh, the proxy's gone because you're actually seeing an image of what it would look like if 
the um, actual borrower had come in. So the proxy information isn't there if you're just borrowing for yourself. Um, so on the right-hand side, you're seeing uh, information about the 29th book that's been scanned. Um, each book that is scanned, the latest one shows up on top. You can see the total amount that's been scanned. Uh, you can go, if you click on one of the options on the ellips ellipsis, you can actually look at loan details. And, um, you know, if you want to see more information than what's actually displayed. And then you can also change the due date if you need to. Um, and uh, let's see here. So then on the next page, let's see here. On the next page, then you could actually see uh, what it would look like if you went to the patrons uh, user details page. Um, you can see uh, how many loans the person has now. This isn't the same person, sorry. I, I was unable to do a live demo. Um, and then how many closed loans the person has. And then you're also able to go to um, see the list you know, if you click on closed loans, you can see the list of all the closed loans the patron has. And then you can also see the list of all the open loans the person has. Um, and then from this page, you can go look at loan details. So this is just a high level view of loan information, kind of like a, it's, it's a table of contents you could say. And then if you go to loan details, you can see more information about the loan and take some actions. Um, you can also do you can also do actions. Um, I'm sorry, I, I forgot to tell Sharon to advance the screen. Um, so from the closed loan page, you can't do a lot, but if you go to the next page, uh, which is open loans, uh, then you can do a lot. Uh, if a patron calls in and says, "Hey, um, you know, I actually brought that book back." Uh, you can go out here and you can say, you can claim that it's been returned so that there could be some action done to see if the book is actually here. You can do a renewal for the patron, uh, change the due date if for some reason you need to do that. You can report an item as lost, uh, charge a, a fee fine, a manual fee fine. Um, cancel a loan, that's a very extreme situation and only uh, certain people would, 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 of course, have permission to do that. Um, and then if you want to look at the loan details, uh, then you would get the next page would come up. And then this is where you can see, like, every action that's happened uh, related to that particular loan. Um, if you need to. And then also on this page, you can do some of the same things. You can renew, uh, change the due date, claim it as returned, whatever. Uh, whatever you need to do. Uh, keep in mind, this is a staff interface. This isn't uh, something that patrons would do. So on the next page, uh, this gives you an idea of how the item would look, um, the item record would look, showing that the, you know, the item's checked out, uh, that there are some requests uh, against it, um, who's borrowed the item, um, you know, from, from so, so looking at it from a, a different angle. Uh, so if you go to the next page, um, I think this is, okay, so this is uh, starting with the fees and fines uh, part of the presentation. So the fees and fines are in the user details, the same as the loans. Uh, so you can go uh, look at the user and uh, you'll see what fees and fines they have. So you can, um, click on the charge fee fine button uh, to charge a fee or fine uh, for the patron. And then you can also go, uh, if you go to the next screen, you can see that you can also charge a fee fine from the loans uh, page. So uh, this would be a case where it's like a manual fee fine. We're not talking about automated overdues or anything like that. This would be perhaps you've noticed that an SD card is missing from a camera or um, a book is damaged or something like that. Um, so depending, you know, either way you can get to charge a, a fee fine. So then the actual manual fee fine is charged on the next screen. Uh, so either way you would come to this page 
where you would actually uh, type in uh, the fee fine. We have a table where all the fee fines for the location would be entered in with a fee fine amount. Um, some places have to charge a VAT or tax. Um, you can type over the amount or the tax if you need to. Um, if, if the fee fine is associated with an item, that information would be in here. Um, and you can put a comment. You can charge the amount and the person can pay it while they're standing there. That would be the case. Um, some libraries sell um, bus passes. They sell um, you know, SD cards, USB drives. Um, we also have situations where you might be charging somebody for, you know, a damaged book, a, a, a replacement SD card. Maybe the camera came back without one. Um, various things that don't have barcodes. Um, and then uh, locker fees, uh, carol fees. There's so many. Uh, it's amazing how, how it varies what libraries actually charge fees and fines for. Uh, so we have to be available to, to, the system has to be able to handle all different kinds of fees and fines. So, so you, after you've charged the fee of fine, of course you wanna be able to look at it. So the next screen, which is the user details page that we already looked at, uh, is where you can actually go look at uh, what fees and fines have been charged. And so you can go, you can click on open or closed uh, fees and fines and either way, you're gonna be able to look at everything. So let's say you clicked on one or the other. Um, the other, oh, I'm sorry. So that's one way that you can get to, to fees and fines. You can also get to fees and fines. If you go to the next screen, you can see from open closed uh, loans. So if you, if you look at the open closed loan page, you'll see that there's a fee fine column and uh, it's blue because that is a link to go look at the fee fine details. Um, and then on the next page, you'll see, you can also do that from, from loan details. You can also click to go see the fee fine. Um, so multiple options for, for going out. Um, anytime you see the fee fine, you can click and go see uh, what, is, what is the fee fine for um, and see more information about it. So then the next screen is where you would end up. So you're going to be looking at the fee fine list, um, which is going to show you either, depending on if you selected to see open fee fines, closed fee fines, or all fee fines. Um, and this page does a lot. Uh, it shows you the outstanding balance for the person. It allows you to uh, select to enter a new fee fine. Um, it allows you to pay uh, fee fines, waive, refund, transfer. Uh, I'll show you some other things that you can do on this page. Right now, the waive, refund, transfer buttons are grayed out because uh, these buttons here interact with the selection boxes here. So you have to actually select something uh, for these buttons to, be, to, to actually show up. Also, if you click uh, the, the, the uh, magnifying glass here, uh, you'll get the next screen, which shows you search and filter, where you can actually um, filter the results. Uh, it might seem odd to some of us who never have uh, fines, but there are, there are many patrons who have pages and pages and pages of fines. And so you may need to filter that. Um, the pay option uh, is something that was requested from a couple different libraries. We have something called quick pay down. So in some libraries, you can't check out uh, material if your uh, fees or fines are over a certain amount that you owe. And in this case, this patron owes $85. Uh, and if they wanna check out books, uh, perhaps they have to have uh, their fees and fines $50 or lower, and they want to pay off $35 so they can check out books. And so the quick pay down is a way uh, for them to pay $35 and you don't have to sit here and click uh, to pay off you know, fees and fines to get to $35. Um, you, the system will handle it for you and we have a algorithm for doing that. 
Um, and then on the next page, um, you'll see the ellipsis options. So with the ellipsis, you can pay, waive, refund, transfer, or report an error, or, or error is actually delete the fee fine as if it never happened. And uh, so the ellipsis would be if you want to do something for one, for one uh, fee fine. And then the buttons are if you want to process several at one time. And then you can look at the fee fine details and you can also go look at the loan details if you want to see information about the loan. So if you, if you elect to look at the fee fine details, then you would go to the next, be at the next screen. Um, oh, actually, I'm not going to the next screen. The next screen shows another way to get to the fee fine details. So if you click on the note icon, you'll see the last comment uh, for the fee fine. And then you can also go to the details from that option. And then uh, the detail page uh, has the same information that the that the uh, that list had, but the added bonus is that you get to see all the actions in reverse chronological order. So you can see everything that happened. This is when the fee was charged, and this is everything that's happened uh, related to the fee fine up to the most recent. The other thing that was requested is that. Uh, in addition to financial transactions, uh, they, the, the users have asked that they be able to just add a comment, a uh, comment only transaction. And so here you can actually add just a comment um, about the transaction or about you know, something that happened, the professor called and, and asked a question. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Holly. We're running out of time, which is yeah, why I was talking. I know. Very <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So okay. Much. Um, and Tanya, uh, I'm here. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, okay, so hi, I'm Tanya Fersenheim, and um, I'm actually going. I work for Fenway Library Organization, and um, I'm actually not going to give you a demo of the requests app today, <clears throat> mostly because a lot of the work that we've put into it so far has been sort of background work that um, is, you know, really in a in shape right now so that we can start adding um, a lot of the like implementing the visible parts of requests. We do have um, oh. Can you go back one slide, Sharon? Oh, okay. Uh, I had a little that's okay. I had a little uh, I was gonna try to put up an image, but that's okay. Don't worry about it. All right. Yeah. Um, so the um, we're, with requests, we're talking about, I think everybody probably knows what requests are, but you were talking about the ability for um, a patron or a staff person on behalf of the patron or a staff person for, you know, some sort of internal process to um, request an item. Um, and we're generally talking about physical items because it's at the moment, um, you know, kind of odd to talk about requesting e-resources, but perhaps someday. Um, so, you know, we're talking about things like requesting something that's um, checked out that you want to have held for you at the library when it comes back. We're talking about being able to recall something so that someone gets it back sooner. Um, people do that a lot when they're trying to do reserves processing, so we all need that. Um, we're also talking about things like paging, um, you know, the concept of having a staff person retrieve something from the stacks for you. Um, either open stacks if you're a super generous library and like to um, do that kind of thing for your patrons. Um, and sometimes the more, um, more common is you know, getting something from closed stacks. And we're also um, working on uh, retrieving things, re requesting things from remote storage and integrations with remote storage systems like robotic um, retrieval systems and things like that. And we're also um, talking about uh, in the, you know, after beta, uh, what other kinds of requests are things that we need to make sure that we're implementing um, and implementing in a, in a thoughtful fashion. So on my next slide, um, we have um, a list of things that we <laughs> can do already. Um, we've gotten a lot of the basic stuff in place. Um, the good news is we can create requests, we can edit requests, we can search for requests, um, we can request things on behalf of a proxy so that if, uh, you know, for example, a graduate student is sponsored by a faculty member um, and can 
borrow things on behalf of that faculty member, we're also making sure that they are, they can be um, allowed. It's not, you know, guaranteed, but they can be allowed to request things for their sponsor. Um, we're actively working on canceling requests because um, there are lots of times that people want to cancel things. And we're working on staff permissions. So, uh, you know, the sort of granular permissions that say which staff person in which role can do things like creating new requests on behalf of the patron, who can cancel requests and things like that, just so that you can you know, sort of parcel out responsibility and um, basically permission to do various things um, in requests. We're working a lot right now on the navigation between the request and the item and the requester so that those things are really smooth so that you can get where you need to be if you're looking at a request and you need to take a look at that item or vice versa. Just making sure that the navigation is um, logical and useful. We're, and of course, I think one of the biggest things that we have been working on, um, and it's probably going to take a little while, is um, requesting rules. The, you know, the structure that we're going to put in place to enable you as library staff to create the rules that govern who can request something, what they can request, when they can request it, whether or not, you know, there's someone who can have something delivered to them or if they're uh, someone who really needs to have that um, picked up at the library. Basically, there's a lot of interplay uh, between different data elements and, you know, patron groups and things like that. So we're working, we're hard at work on figuring out what kind of structure we can put in place to make sure that the library staff can um, make the kind of sophisticated rules that they really need to make. On the next slide, um, uh, this is, you know, fulfillment of requests, you know, it's, it's really nice to be able to place a request, um, but eventually you need to be able to hand that to somebody. So um, for fulfillment of requests, we're, we've worked a lot on um, pickup requests, so something that, uh, you know, a, a patron wants to be able to pick up the library. We've worked a lot on recalls, the, you know, the, the stuff in place to make sure that someone can recall an item and get the potentially get that back sooner from the person who currently has it. We um, have started, we have some stuff in place for delivery, but we're still working out some of the details there. You know, the what happens when um, someone has requested something be delivered to them. And, you know, that at some point that item is outside the physical control of the library, but may or may not be in the physical control of the person who requested it. So like what kinds of things do we put in place there? Um, and we're working a lot on the interrelationships between item status and request status. Um, you know, if something, if a request is awaiting pickup, then the item should really also be awaiting pickup. Um, just making sure that everything is correlated um, that way. And um, we're working on the request queue and uh, the way that Folio decides what order to fill a request in if something, if an item comes into the CERC desk. Um, and then of course, we're working with another one of the uh, subgroups on what happens at check-in. So what kind of alerts might need to pop up to let staff people know that there's something unusual about this check-in that just happened and that something un unusual is related to requests. What kind of slips might need to print um, you know, not everybody's going to want to print slips, but some people are. Um, and what kind of notifications might need to go out to patrons to let them know that the thing that you requested is available or is on its way to you and, you know, let them get all excited about that. So um, I'm sorry I don't have a demo today, but I will probably next time because I'll have a lot more visible things to show because a lot of the back end stuff is in place. So I am going to hand it over to Harry. Um, actually, we're at oh, we are. the bottom of the, well, Harry, do you want to sum up uh, for us? Do you think you can do that? In a sure. Um, yeah. for, well, we yeah. could have another folio forum, I think, here um, on the, the update of the roadmap with some other um, things we didn't get to. That would be very helpful. But do you want to sum up, Harry? That would be wonderful. Um, sure, why not? Um, 
the one thing I want to mention is uh, early on in this project, we started with a, a very small group of developers, and that was important because we really had a core platform that needed to be built. And first and foremost, um, I think it's important that people think about Folio as a services platform that's extendable in any different way in all different directions for any different features or functionality that really libraries believe they need either now or in the future. And of course, once that platform was in the place, we started to get ourselves into a position, especially with the formation of the special interest groups, um, where we can start to do more and more work in parallel. And as you can see in this chart, um, uh, by the end uh, or by the end of 2017, last year, um, we had about 55 developers. Um, the slide is actually old, and we're actually, if I'm not mistaken, over 65 developers as of today. And we expect to see this continue to happen. And this is important because, um, one moment. Uh, everyone can see my spreadsheet, right? All right. And so at a very high level, um, these are the milestones and really deadlines that we've set for ourselves as a project. And you see a lot of this actually being demonstrated or presented upon today. And uh, our goals here are by the middle of the year to achieve um, what we believe is beta, um, which is a set of features and functionality that the community has agreed upon would be reasonable or viable for a first version of a system that can manage some libraries. Uh, we're not saying it's going to be perfect for every library, but there's enough basic functionality there where uh, data can start to be loaded. Uh, you can start to experiment with the system, start to think about what it might be like to migrate onto a system like this. And then ideally the end of the year, end of 2018, where we're actually in a position where we're able to release what we would call finished software, software that we believe is stable enough to operate a library. And by looking at this chart, what this actually implies is basically spending the time between July and the end of the year to stabilize everything that's been built, improve any features or functionality that need it. Um, we'd be going through user acceptance testing with librarians as well, getting feedback as to what was built correctly, what may not have been, and what needs to be fixed or adjust adjusted. This is all available online. Um, in addition, uh, you can also find online really a breakdown, um, again, at relatively high level, that represents the different teams and the different people. And in fact, you've met the majority of the product owners right here on this call today. And you can actually see them here listed in this document, along with the UI designer, which is key, because for Folio, um, as we form development teams, it's not just the software developers, but it's the product owners who work hand in hand with the special interest groups, which are actually the librarians or the subject matter experts. And in addition to that, the UI designer as well to make sure we're getting that design process um, or design as part of the process as early as possible. Um, again, we're really out of time, so I don't have a, um, really any more time to spend on this, but all of this documentation is available online. Please go ahead, take a look. If you have any questions, what we're expecting to see for V1, as you take a look at this spreadsheet, you get to see the list of the features, through all of these tabs, you'll see, for an example here, line 13, a line drawn. Um, that is at a bare minimum what we expect to see in a first version of Folio. Um, that said, uh, the different teams um, will be pulling from below the lines as they free up as those features reach completion. And at that point, I conclude my discussion about roadmap. And um, thank you, everyone. Um, I and I think some others may have a few minutes to hang around as well um, to answer any last minute questions. And um, we encourage all of you to take part in the Folio community. And um, thank you. Thank you everybody for coming. And just a reminder that this recording will be on the open library environment.org website and we will post the slides there as well and thank you for your participation and your questions and as Harry said if uh, there's one question we'll answer that we're here still and we'll answer that but others 
can go on with their day. Thank you so much to all our, our uh, presenters. They did a wonderful job going through a lot of material. So thank you so much for your help. All right, bye-bye. Um, one of the final questions here is uh, a library uses Koha, can the data be migrated and can Folio be hosted without using EBSCO, Bywater, or um, I'm not sure who that last one is. I'm scared to pronounce it. I think that's um, supposed to be Circe. I think it's Circe. Oh, Circe. Okay. <laughs> Typo. Um, so if you have Koha, the data can be migrated. Although at this time, a specific migration tool does not ex yet exist for Koha. That said, there will be one forthcoming. Um, in addition, Folio, from the beginning, uh, one of the tenants was uh, that it needs to be designed so it can be hosted by an organization, whether it be a company or a consortia type entity, uh, but also it needs to uh, have the ability to be installed locally as well, and it can be. Um, the code is all out there, openly available today. Um, although, you know, again, it's early, but you can download it, you can install it, you can run it, you can start to experiment with it and load data. And so, absolutely. And Harry, do you have the next question there? Um, how do you see post V1 work happening? Um, yes. So, uh, you know, V1 for Folio is really at this point just a milestone, a goal. Um, one of the things we've done for this project, which is really very different from any open source project, at least that I've either, either seen or been somewhat involved in, is we've tried to adopt an agile methodology in terms of how we develop, how we move forward, how we prioritize features and functionality. So uh, when you take a look at the spreadsheet, um, taking a look at all the features and functionality that are there, they're all critically important, and we know that. Um, drawing the line doesn't mean one thing is more important than the other. Um, we do know we need to build all of that at some point. But the way we've tackled this is we go through a periodic, um, roughly quarterly prioritization process of all the features that exist on the backlog at a high level. And we do this with the product council and we do this also with the special interest groups as well. And then based on that priority, as it makes sense, the different development teams start to pull those features and functionality and work on them. And so what we expect to happen is once this V1 release occurs, we're gonna move more into a mode of continuous integration and continuous deployment, where at any given time, there'll be a snapshot with the latest and greatest features that were added. Um, I'm not sure necessarily we're going to see an old fashioned or traditional release cycle where here's V1, here's V2, Here's V3. Um, we'd, li we'd like to see something happen much more granular, consistent, and constant. Great. Thank you. I think that's all our questions. I think we're, <clears throat> we're up to date. That's great. We had a lot of wonderful questions. We did. And thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you. <laughs> this was, was good. Very yeah, this was helpful. a really good job. I, I think uh, it was a lot of information to digest. It'll It'll be good to get this up online. Uh, can I get the slide deck, Sharon, from you? Sure. Sure. I'll give that to you right away. Okay. Um, yeah. Good Is it, job. Um, thank you, this... Holly. I'm sorry you had to rush, but thank you, and Tanya. <laughs> Is, um, Is everyone else? Is it just us right now, or? Uh, we still have a few people in. Okay. For you two that are on, any other questions? Well, there are 18 people, so we're okay. not limiting to the first two people. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Only the first two people. <laughs> so anyone in general, any other questions? <laughs> it sounds like we're at time. All right. Okay, okay. Thank okay. You, wonderful. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Everybody. You guys did a great job. Fantastic. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.